pyramids are surveyors' targets to conduct planetary surveying. Their purpose is to measure the distance between the Earth and the Sun. This is done so that the Earth can stay in the Goldilocks zone, which means it's not too far or too close to the Sun for the purpose of growing life on Earth. This is Hatshepsut Temple in Egypt. It has an inner chamber that illuminates during the winter solstice sunrise. An inner chamber means it's a room that is deep within the structure. It is lit up by a beam of light only on the winter solstice sunrise. If you want to get an idea of what this effect would have looked like, check out the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark in the map room scene. Steven Spielberg, or whoever wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark, probably visited Hatshepsut or Karnak in Egypt at some point, and they saw the inner sanctum was illuminated by a beam of light. Except in the movie, the beam of light indicates the buried location of the Ark, whereas the truth is, these structures were, were for planetary surveying, which means this is, you can tell that because the inner sanctum is lit up on the winter solstice sunrise. The location of gold or treasure or an ark is just a human projection of valuable worth. The true worth that we need to value is the sun and the earth's rotation relative to each other and the earth's capacity to bear life. I always remembered when I was young this scene seemed really profound and it is profound it's just you've got to look past the Steven Spielberg silliness and look at the deeper truth of the implications of what it means. This is actual footage of Hatshepsut's uh, exterior on the winter solstice sunrise. These doorways block the light from entering the inner chamber except on this one specific day. There's the inner sanctum deep down in there. I can't find any footage recorded in the inner sanctum of the beam of light illuminating the inner chamber, but I'm sure someone's got footage of it somewhere. This is footage of Hatshepsut's inner chamber. This is recorded a couple of days after the winter solstice sunrise, but it shows the inner uh, sort of rooms and this is the inner sanctum right there with the light box above it. This is Karnak in Egypt. It also has an inner sanctum that has a beam of light focused upon it during the winter solstice. So the sun's position relative to the earth was being triangulated on the winter solstice because they, these two sites were both aligning on the exact same day. So what are surveyors targets and what is planetary surveying? To understand this, let's have a look at normal surveying on earth by humans. Electronic distance measurement or EDM is a method of determining the length between two points using electromagnetic waves. EDM is commonly carried out with digital instruments called theodolites. EDM instruments are highly reliable convenient pieces of survey equipment and can be used to measure distances of up to 100 kilometers. Devices known as total stations share similarities with theodolites and can be used to measure distances as well as angles. The electromagnetic wave that is sent out by the theodolite or the total station is reflected off a reflective prism. This is how the measurements are determined, by calculating the amount of time it takes for the signal to bounce back to the transmitter. These are surveyor's targets with prisms in the center. The purpose of the triangles on the outside are to draw the viewer's eye to the center point, which is where the signal is reflected. The theodolite or the total station is very much like a telescope 
And when they're zoomed in, sometimes they're off the center point target. And so they paint these triangles around the edges to draw the viewer's eye to the center point, which is the target. But there are also surveyor's targets that don't have prisms in the center. Here are some examples of surveyor's targets that do not have prisms in the center of them. They are used for checking levels. They're called control points because they check that the level isn't moving up or down. There's no undesired movement in the structure relative to other control points. So they're used as con for reference to compare them to other levels. In this example here, a surveyor's target is attached to each pylon of this bridge. And so by comparing each target to surrounding targets or a control point, off the bridge, they can tell whether the pylons are sinking or whether they're staying level, and so they know whether or not they need to reinforce the footings of the pylons. Here are surveyors' targets being set up on a railway line to check that the railway tracks are level. In open cut mines like this, landslips are very dangerous, so what they do is they set up surveyors targets along the edges of the road so that if there's any erosion or any signs that the road is about to collapse then they are, they're aware of the movement. They compare the control points such as these to other control points around the edge. EDMs are used for measuring short distances on earth. However for measuring longer distances such as planetary surveying, lasers and retroreflectors are used. Humans currently conduct planetary surveying via the reflectors that were left on the moon by the Apollo moon astronauts. The distance to the moon is regularly measured by flashing a light at it and then timing the return of the reflection. Not quite like this, but rather with a laser and a telescope. The laser beam is aimed at reflectors which were left on the surface of the moon by the moon mission astronauts. This technique can measure the distance to the moon and changes in that distance to better than 3 centimetres. The total distance travelled by the laser is then calculated by multiplying the time that it takes from sending the laser to receiving the reflection by the speed of light. Since the laser light travels both to the moon and back, the distance to the moon is half of this calculated distance. The planets are alive and conscious. The sun god Ra and earth goddess Sophia engaged in the services of surveyor gods such as Vishnu the Preserver to construct sites like Angkor Wat Cambodia. These surveyors target sites for planetary surveying allowed the planets to rotate correctly which enabled life to grow on earth. Here is the example of the sun rising directly over the main tower at Angkor Wat, exactly on the equinox every year. This planetary surveying that was conducted in mankind's ancient past was extremely advanced, probably more advanced than any techniques we have now. The sun's rays are sent photons, as are lasers, so it's the same thing, so somehow photons are involved. Planets in our solar system, including the Earth, revolve around our Sun. But what a lot of people don't visualise is the fact that the Sun is also moving. The Sun migrates around our galaxy. This is reflected in the zodiac signs, stars we see in the sky. A good way to visualise the relationship between the Earth and the Sun is to visualise our Sun as a speedboat and the Earth as a skier that is being towed behind it. A helpful way to visualise the equinoxes and the solstices is to visualise the skier or the Earth being towed by the Sun and when the skier leans out to the side that's a solstice and when it's directly behind the boat that's an equinox. So one side being the summer solstice and the other side being the winter solstice. So the purpose of surveyors targets like Hatshepsut and Karnak and Angkor Wat 
it's to let the earth know when our cycle is over and it's time to lean out in the other direction. There's a hole in the tip of the main tower at Angkor Wat and apparently the hole goes all the way down to several metres underground. Praveen Mohan made a video about it, please do check it out. National Geographic made this documentary about Angkor Wat and about the uh, light shining through the tip of the main tower. They subsequently deleted the documentary but I managed to get this footage which shows the beam of light coming directly down through the main tower. Does this remind you of something? I knew instantly this was a midday alignment that was being surveyed from Angkor Wat. The fact that this footage was deleted shows there's some kind of a cover up where they don't want people to understand what these structures are for. Praveen Mohan also goes into the fact that the inner sanctum at Angkor Wat is uh, walled off from the public so that people can't go in there and study these structures. So what is a midday alignment? Well, Hatshepsut has a morning alignment, which means that the surveying was conducted as soon as the sun came up over the horizon. A midday alignment is when the sun is in the subsolar point or the vertex point directly above, or the, the midday at midday. When the sun is directly above, that means a survey reading is being conducted at that time. When the sun is directly overhead, it's called Lahaina Noon, common name, but it's also the vertex point or the subsolar point. It's extremely important to understand this moment in relation to studying pyramids because this is the moment where most of them is when the con surveying was conducted from them. To conduct planetary surveying, apparently three points are required to draw the line. So for example, these two styrofoam balls represent the Sun and the Earth. The line that is being drawn from the Earth to the Sun, this is what it looks like if there's only one point, the line could go anywhere. Whereas if two points are established, then that draws a direct line to the center of the sun. When the skewer is driven into the styrofoam ball, it establishes two points. This points directly to the center of the sun, which is how the planetary surveying was conducted. The sun and the earth are both moving targets. They're both moving, so if you want to draw a line between the two of them, you need three points. Two wouldn't do it. Looking at the Raiders of the Lost Ark scene, there are actually four points established, but uh, in reality only three are required. But let's look at these four just as examples. So there is the point on the floor at which the beam hits the ground. There's the staff jewel. There's the mouth of the doorway. And there's the center of the sun. But the reality is only three points are required. That is the point on the ground where the light hits the mouth of the doorway and the center of the sun. The staff and the jewel are just plot points thrown into this movie so that the uh, main character has an advantage over the bad guys, but in reality it's, it's not really part of the story. The doorway to the map room is extremely important. I do appreciate the sense of importance this movie gives to the, the beam of light coming through the doorway because that is close to the truth.
So real world examples of the three points here at Hatshepsut. So there's the center of the sun, there's the doorway framing the beam of light, And the third point is the inner sanctum lit up on the winter solstice. That is planetary surveying. So here are some examples of the same phenomena at other sites. This is the mound at Newgrange, which aligns on the winter solstice. Exactly the same as Hatshepsut. It has an inner sanctum that is only illuminated on the winter solstice. And it has these doorways on the outside that frame and will not allow the sunlight to penetrate except exactly on the winter solstice. This is good footage because it shows the inner sanctum being lit up on the solstice. It wasn't just the Egyptians that were making doing these alignments, it was also happening in England with their mounds as well as the stone circles they were using. Here's another example at Low Crew megalithic site in Ireland. The rising sun on the equinoxes illuminates the inner sanctum. So it's not a solstice alignment, it's an equinox alignment. Very interesting. There's the inner sanctum. Very much like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Except no staff and crystal are needed. These illustrations represent the three points at Hatshepsut, Karnap, and Angkor Wat. So the first point is the center of the sun. The second point is the outer doorway. And the third point is the, is the inner sanctum. Hatshepsut and Karnak are morning alignments, whereas Angkor Wat is a midday alignment with the hole going at the tip of the main tower. And you can see the tunnel going all the way down into the underground chamber. In the Raiders of the Lost Ark map room scene, the size of the room is actually quite small, whereas these structures are actually quite large, so the distance between the doorway and the inner sanctum is quite a long way away, so that cuts out a lot of room for error. These kits that um, kids make styrofoam balls into the planets in the solar system are actually quite accurate in that the pyramids are there to designate set distances between the planetary bodies. So adding a, like a pyramid at the base of the skewer where it enters the Earth would, I think it'd be a very accurate representation of what the pyramids were for. This is Phnom Bok Hill Temple. It aligns with the summer solstice when looked at from the west gate of Angkor Wat. So the west gate is the same place where you could see the, uh, the equinox alignment over the main tower of Angkor Wat. But if you looked on the summer solstice, you would, if you looked at Phnom Bok Temple, you would see the sun rising above it, just like the main tower of Angkor Wat. There's no footage of it, but I'm sure someone will get a footage of it one day. So once again, we have the three points. There's the center of the sun, there's Phnom Bok Hill Temple, and then there's the west gate at Angkor Wat. Two earthbound points establishing a line and the center of the sun as the third point. Angkor Wat and Phnom Bok Hill Temple were Hindu temples. Phnom Bok Hill was dedicated to Vishnu, I believe. But so the, the Hindu gods were very much involved in the planetary surveying and the construction of planet Earth and our solar system.
Ankar Wat aligns with the north, south, west and east cardinal directions. So what do I think was going on at Ankar Wat? What is a surveyor's target for? Both precision and accuracy are important for geodetic surveying. The aim is to get measurements that average as close as possible to the truth, and to do so in a way that's repeatable, so you can confidently compare them to any future measurements. One way to verify your measurements is to compare them to a known position, such as a planetary surveying target like Ankar Wat or the Giza Pyramid, using the most accurate surveying methods possible in order to provide known starting points which act as truth for surveyors and solar system engineers and constructors. In geodetic surveying, precision refers to how close your repeated measurements come to agreeing with each other. Good surveying procedures contribute to precise measurement. Verifying that your measurements yield final coordinates that agree with a known reference system such as the Ankar Wat Cambodia enables you to evaluate their accuracy. Ankar Wat Cambodia this is the most up-to-date version of positional truth available in the solar system. By tying into it, you inherently gain the built-in accuracy of that system. And by carefully following proper surveying procedures, you increase your chances of repeatable results, which promotes better precision. So now what we're looking at here is the Ankar Wat survey target. Yeah, let that, let that sink in uh, for a couple of minutes because uh, this is a uh, really a phenomenal piece of uh, technology that Vishnu PSS has uh, developed for surveyors. And, and so uh, what we did was we went out to uh, Angkor Wat, Cambodia, and we used our GPS um, surveying device to set a number of uh, GPS control points so that we would be able to have control to uh, measure into the planet's alignment and give the Earth the capacity to bear life. So the beam of sunlight that strikes the inner sanctum at Hatshepsut on the winter solstice was a morning alignment. This Ankar Wat's the hole in the main tower. It's a midday alignment. Praveen Mohan said there's a stone box in the bottom of the chamber 90 feet below the tip. As with a lot of these structures, it's probably debatable what was actually there originally or what the purpose of it was. So this National Geographic documentary, which was deleted, which portrayed this footage, which shows the light beam coming through the tip of the main tower at Angkor Wat. They don't specify what date it occurred on. I've got text on this video saying it was on the equinox, but you can disregard that. It probably wasn't on the equinox, but the point is we don't actually know. And um, National Geographic had deleted this video, so they don't want people to know. But as we can plainly see, it was clearly an alignment, just like in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, except it was a midday alignment, not a morning alignment. So what I think was happening at Ankar Wat when the alignment occurred was that when the sun was directly overhead, the light beam that penetrated the main tower was divided into four directions, the cardinal directions, and then that signal was sent deep out into outer space, and then those readings were checked from year to year to make sure the planet was in alignment. The inner sanctum has been walled off from the public, but originally the inner, or the, the chamber just below the main tower it was open to the other rooms that are surrounding it, facing the cardinal directions. And so that signal would have been sent off deep into outer space for planetary surveying.
this center video of Pravin's gets into how the main chamber inside Angkor is uh, walled off from the public. And the one on the left gets into how the whole structure aligns with north, south, west and east. But there is the blocks that they use to block up entrance to the main central area. Buddhist monks or restorers probably did this kind of work, but it wasn't in line with the original structure and that doorway didn't exist. So we have to look at these structures with open minds. We love the Buddhists for preserving these structures over the uh, such a long period of time, but we really need to analyze these structures with an open mind. So it's entirely possible that the tunnel that running down the main tower might be set at an angle. We can see the way that the um, the alignment at Angkor Wat on the equinox, the structure is not on the equator, which is where logically where you would build such a structure, then you wouldn't have to account for a skewed reading. So we really need to investigate these structures. Angkor Wat and the Giza pyramids align to north, south, west, east cardinal directions, as do hundreds of other temples and pyramids all over the world. This is extremely strong evidence as to their true purpose, which is that, that their purpose relates to planetary surveying. So on screen there's surveyor's targets on the pylons of a bridge, and the example is given that the person who put the target on the pylon would keep it aligned with the horizon line because it's in alignment with the purpose of the target. They didn't align these ancient structures with the cardinal directions for no reason. They knew exactly what they were doing. So one just has to look at the evidence with an open mind. The distance between the Earth and the Sun was measured from these structures, usually on the equinoxes and the solstices. So 
So the Earth was basically water skiing behind their sun. And if you visualize the rope that holds the skier behind the sun as a ruler measuring the distance, so it's a set distance that is um, checked every equinox and solstice. The distance between the sun and the earth was a primary measurement because it was of high importance, whereas the north, south, west, east were secondary measurements. The primary reading couldn't be altered at all. It was extremely important that it stay constant, whereas the secondary readings were not as important, but they were certainly checked and very important, just not to as much of a degree. The cardinal directions would have been checked far deep into outer space. So I've drawn the cross quite close to the Earth, but really it was a long way away that these measurements were being perceived from. So there's the cord, the um, rope towing the water skier in the Goldilocks zone. So the problem with the analogy of the water skier is that the, the skier can't swivel freely. So it's useful to use a different analogy at this point when visualizing this. So leaving behind the water skiing analogy at this point, if we visualize a fisherman on a boat and they have a fishing line and the earth is on the end of the hook, the reason this is a good analogy is because Fishermen have a swivel just above their hook and that allows the hook to spin around 360 degrees. So that's why I think it's a good analogy. But if you visualize that the fishermen had their line locked, so it's at a set length distance from the boat, so it's not changing distance, it's, it's not being drawn in and out. So the, another analogy to use rather than the fisherman is the uh, pirate ship boat wheel. People who have boats have these big wheels that control the steering of the um, boat. And if you visualize that as what was happening right at places like Angkor Wat, the earth was being steered, the earth's axis was being steered like a pirate on a pirate ship through a big wheel. It's keeping the alignment of the poles and the axis during the equinoxes and the solstices. So strange as it seems, this is the best analogy I can give for what's, what's happening on the Earth when this planetary surveying was being conducted. The movement of the wheel in this animation has been exaggerated greatly. It was just very, very fine tuning of just slight nudges of turning of the axis of the Earth when it was required. But the, yeah, the swivel just above the hook indicates that the earth was spinning freely as it, as it trailed behind the sun. I'm quite interested in the Hindu gods because they do seem to be more involved in planetary surveying than any other deity that I know of. If you look at Angkor Wat in Cambodia or the other temples in Cambodia or the ancient temples in India. It was very much a Hindu thing that was going on. These Hindu gods are very much involved. So when they say things like in Angkor Wat, oh, the, the site is aligned with the West and that means it's a Vishnu site, I find information like that very interesting because that means that aspect of God was in charge of keeping the alignment to the west in check. So there were different aspects of different gods in different directions and they had a particular god to, they had a particular agenda to keep the earth in alignment from that particular direction. So it's all quite interesting stuff.
another good analogy is someone juggling and each hand is the solstice, whereas the center point is the equinox. It's a good analogy because the earth is spinning in between these times. So if you visualize the ball that he's juggling as the earth, it's spinning in between the points at which it, the measurements are taken. So the sun and the earth are moving targets. This is what makes them so different from the analogy of the bridge because they're both constantly moving so there's a lot more flux in the equation. Whereas a bridge is just a, it just sits there and it, it doesn't move much. So my best guess as to what was happening on the Giza pyramids is that the same thing that was happening at Angkor Wat is that when the primary reading was taken between the earth and the sun, there was also a secondary reading taken in the four cardinal directions. So my best guess about Giza pyramids would be that there was a tunnel coming down from the main tip so that the light would only penetrate on specific given days, most probably the equinoxes and the solstices. The reason there'd be a tunnel at the tip of the three Giza pyramids was because it was to establish the two earthbound points which were pointing to the third point which was the sun so the two earthbound points were unmoving whereas the sun and the earth are moving targets and continuously moving i would suggest that most pyramids had a hole at the tip of the main top of the pyramid embedded into the structure this is to establish the two earthbound points so I'm not sure which pyramid this is at Giza, but um, it's quite easy that some of these rocks could have been moved to cover up the hole in the tip of the main structure. Just like Angkor Wat, the main inner sanctum in, in was blocked off. These structures are blocked off sometimes for good intentions. It's to stop rain damage inside the structure. There is a history of these structures being covered up. The hole in the tip of the Sphinx was covered up and I understand why they do it to stop tourists going in there but it'd be good if we had good blueprints of exactly what was inside these structures so that we can study them open-mindedly and honestly. Apparently the Sphinx aligns with the Equinox which doesn't surprise me at all. It fits right in with this theory but I haven't seen any photos of the phenomenon but there's this animation that I found. At the location of the shafts, they lay a trunk 20 by 20 centimeters, which will make the shaft towards the star Sirius. The two shafts target the stars of Sirius and Alnilam. The middle chamber shaft will point to Sirius at 39 degrees 49 minutes, December 4th at midnight, 0 hundred hours at 180 degrees. 
Anilum is at the heart of the Orion constellation. The King Shaft will target Anilum on November 11th, also at 0 hundred hours to 180 degrees. Note the breathtaking precision of the sky measurements, knowing that the stars move. If this is all chance, then all the science we know today belongs in the trash. The date of the construction of the pyramid and the memory of all who worked there. They used the sky configuration of that year. This gives us precisely the date of the construction of the Great Pyramid between 2560 and 2550 BC. Fifty years later or earlier, the shafts would never be aligned again. This means that they had a thorough knowledge of astronomy. This explains the offsets and turns of the North Tunnels. So let's talk about these shafts that emanate from the King's and Queen's Chamber and the Giza Pyramids. They're very interesting. Obviously, I think they were used for planetary surveying. These lower access tunnels were drains for preventing water damage to the structure because they want to prevent water damage. These higher sections were for accessing the King's and Queen's Chamber for adjusting the alignments. and. So this is what I realized about these structure was that there are two tunnels coming out of the King's Chamber and there are two tunnels coming out of the Queen's Chamber. So what was going on was it was a co-current alignment. So whatever they were checking in that left green shaft of the King's Chamber, it was corresponding to what they were checking on the right green shaft of the King's Chamber. And the same with the Queen's Chamber it was a simultaneous alignment just how with Angkor Wat when they were checking the direction a midday alignment directly above they were at the same time checking the, the um, cardinal directions so just like when you're taking a photo with a camera if you leave the lens open for a long time you get a blurry photo but if you if there's a precise moment where the lens is open you get a a clear snapshot of what's going on and they were aligning these two star systems or whatever was being pointed at through these tunnels they were being aligned at the exact same time I don't claim to know what was being aligned through these shafts or when but it looks like it wasn't the Sun's position it looks like planetary bodies or galaxies beyond our solar system were being aligned with so this was much deeper surveying than just within our solar system. And yes, I do believe that our Milky Way galaxy's axis was aligned through the, the pl planetary surveying that was conducted through these shafts. So for example, that tunnel going off the left of the King's Chamber could have been pointing to the center of our Milky Way galaxy and when that alignment corresponded with, say, Sirius or whatever other star system, some other galaxy that was way beyond our galaxy, that was, um, this is deep space surveying that was being conducted, very far away objects that were being looked at. 
and it was all done for the purpose of growing life on Earth. It's a planetary surveying for sure. The fact that these shafts' angles change over the distance would indicate that the reading might have shifted. They might have been aligning to a particular star system and then changed and started aligning to a, a different star system because they found it was a better alignment. And also the cover stones of the pyramids covered up the ends of these shafts when the structure was finished, which would indicate that they finished taking alignment readings from these shafts and they were no longer necessary, so they just covered them over. But the structure may have been half finished for an extremely long period of time, many thousands of years, if not longer, during which they would have been conducting planetary surveying. And then once they were finished using these shafts for what they needed, they just covered them over. This is exactly what we would expect if benevolent ETs built the pyramid to conduct planetary surveying. If you look at the, the passageways from the side angle, then what do you see here? Surveyors' targets for conducting planetary surveying. I want you to see how the timeline was fixed. So the starting year of the timeline is aligned with the pole star and the Pleiades. And this is again from these pyramid books. So you have to wait for a moment where the pole star, which again is the star that never moves in the night sky, it's the north star, it always stays in one place, all the other stars rotate around it in circles. So you got to have the pole star and it has to shine down through the descending passage all the way down into the pit at the bottom. So you see that black line that goes down below the surface of the pyramid and there's a room down there, that's where the feet are as we just showed you. And then it's on top, it's, it actually has to bore through solid bedrock. So that, by the way, that, that descending passageway deviates by less than a quarter of an inch all the way down. In the so now I want you to envision the North Star shining all the way down so that you could put a, 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 a bowl of water at the bottom of the pit and you'd see the image of the North Star in the water. That means it's in perfect alignment. Then you got to have the Pleiades directly overhead. So the absolute overhead point where the Pleiades are right there precisely at the exact center of the dome of the heavens. So that only happens once. And that's what fixates the alignment. And then inside, there's an exact set of lines called the scored lines. And that represents when you start counting by one pyramid inch equals one year. So here again, uh, this, so let me just go back to that slide. The coordinate, coordinates of when you start counting are set by these scored lines. The scored lines you can actually see here, uh, there, is, there is a descending passage. So there's the descending passage again. And then what we actually find as you go down the descending passage is these lines carved into the wall. Well, those lines apparently are the marker for that alignment of 2141 BC, which is when this alignment took place. And then as you go on through the pyramid timeline from here, you have an amazing, amazing number of things where by starting at 2141 BC, start at the scored lines, count one inch equals one year, and you go all the way through this stuff, so many things are so precisely calibrated in the pyramid surveyors targets that the idea that this was random is impossible you could not have the planets in our solar system aligned without the use of surveyors targets so many dates that all correspond the great pyramid also had the the procession of the equinoxes across the diagonals and the big thing of course is the capstone this is an exaggerated view of the Great Pyramid as it exists today. And, and again, we're seeing that all of the different measurements of the pyramid have all these interesting symbolic connections. You have the year encoded in the dimensions. You have the procession of the equinoxes encoded in the, the 25,826.4 pyramid inches, which again is very close to the 25,000 years. If you actually take the slope angle of the pyramid, meaning the angle of its actual slope angle, and then you take the latitude line through uh, the pyramid, and you draw that angle. This is the slope angle, by the way, it's the angle of the inner passageways. This is not the actual surface of the pyramid on the outside. This is the angle of the inner passageways of the pyramid. 
Okay, that's 26.3 degrees. So if you take a straight latitude line and you put it through the Great Pyramid, so that's straight east to west, and then you take the, the angle of the inner passageways and you draw it up from the pyramid and you go east, it directly, without any mathematical fudge factor whatsoever, it directly crosses through Bethlehem. That line bifurcates Bethlehem. The structures that we build today would probably be significantly more sacred if we did actually help the gods with their planetary surveying and align those structures with the star systems. So do you not agree with my theories? That's okay. There's 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and none of them agree with me. I'm the only person that believes pyramids are surveyors' targets. I completely came up with this theory all on my own. I've obsessively studied pyramids for the last 25 years. I'm not an atheist, I'm open-minded, and I don't have preconceived notions clouding my judgment. How long will it take for one person to convince 7.7 .7 billion people of the truth? I am confident that the passage of time will prove my theories to be true. A lot of people believed the earth was flat until Pythagoras proposed that it was a round sphere. People believed the sun revolved around the earth till Copernicus said that the earth actually revolves around the sun. And here now, Philip Lawson me. I'm revealing pyramids are surveyors targets for conducting planetary surveying. The main blockage seems to be that many modern historians and archaeologists are atheists and they project that onto these ancient people. The ancient Egyptians were not atheists. The ancient Mayans were not atheists. They covered their structures with thousands of depictions of the gods. They were interacting with the gods. And if you're pissed off that the gods don't interact with you, I'm sorry, but... Maybe they think you're boring. Maybe you should try building some pyramids. A lot of people are obsessed with finding another habitable planet, Earth-like planet, in deep space for us to colonise. But I think it's more important that we work out how to construct another Earth ourselves. And the best way to do that is by reverse engineering how this planet was constructed. So we need to study these structures with an open mind. All the theories in this video are copyrighted to me and they are my registered intellectual property. Contact me if you want to make a movie or a computer game about them.